Chapter Three, Part Four of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter Three: The Period of Growth. Part Four: Loan Words. The Indians of the New West, it would seem had little to add to the contributions already made to the American vocabulary by the Algonquins of the Northeast. The American people, by the beginning of the second quarter of the nineteenth century, knew almost all they were destined to know of the Aborigine, and they had names for all the new objects that he had brought to their notice, and for most of his peculiar implements and ceremonies. A few translated Indian terms, example squaw man big chief great white father and happy hunting ground represent the meagre fresh stock that the western pioneers got from him of more importance was the suggestive and indirect effect of his polysynthetic dialects and particularly of his vivid proper names example rain in the face young man afraid of his wife and voice like thunder these names and other word phrases like them made an instant appeal to american humor and were extensively imitated in popular slang one of the surviving coinages of that era is old stick in the mud which farmer and henley note as having reached england by eighteen twenty three contact with the french in louisiana and along the canadian border and with the Spanish in Texas and further west, brought many more new words. From the Canadian French, as we have already seen, prairie, bateau, portage, and rapids had been borrowed during colonial days. To these French contributions, bayou, picayune, levy, chute, butte, crevasse, and lagnap, were now added and probably also shanty and canuck the use of brave to designate an indian warrior almost universal until the close of the indian wars was also of french origin from the spanish once the mississippi was crossed and particularly after the mexican war in eighteen forty six there came a swarm of novelties many of which have remained firmly embedded in the language among them were numerous names of strange objects lariat lasso ranch loco weed mustang sombrero canyon desperado poncho chaparral corral bronco plaza peon cayuse burro mesa tornado sierra and adobe to them as soon as gold was discovered were added bonanza el dorado placer and vigilante cinch was borrowed from the spanish cincha in the early texas days though its figurative use did not come in until much later ante the poker term though the etymologists point out its obvious origin in the latin probably came into american from the spanish thornton's first example of its use in its current sense is dated eighteen fifty seven but bartlett reported it in the form of anti in eighteen forty eight coyote came from the mexican dialect of spanish its first parent was the aztec coyotl tamale had a similar origin and so did frijole and tomato none of these is good spanish as usual derivatives quickly followed the newcomers among them peonage bronco buster ranchmen and ranch house and the verbs to ranch to lasso to corral to ante up and to cinch to vamos from the spanish vamos let us go came in at the same time so did sabe 
so did gazabo this was also the period of the first great immigrations and the american people now came into contact on a large scale with peoples of divergent race particularly germans irish catholics from the south of ireland the irish of colonial days were descendants of cromwell's army and came from the north of ireland and on the pacific coast chinese so early as the twenties the immigration to the united states reached twenty five thousand in a year in eighteen twenty four the legislature of new york in alarm passed a restrictive act footnote most of the provisions of this act however were later declared unconstitutional several subsequent acts met the same fate End footnote. the know nothing movement of the fifties need not concern us here suffice it to recall that the immigration of eighteen forty five passed the one hundred thousand mark and that that of eighteen fifty four came within sight of five hundred thousand these new americans most of them germans and irish did not all remain in the east a great many spread through the west and southwest with the other pioneers their effect upon the language was not large perhaps but it was still very palpable and not only in the vocabulary of words of german origin sauerkraut and noodle as we have seen had come in during the colonial period apparently through the so-called pennsylvania dutch i e a mixture much debased of the german dialects of switzerland swabia and the palatinate the new immigrants now contributed pretzel pumpernickel house frau lager beer pinochle wienerwurst dumb for stupid frankfurter bock beer schnitzel laborwurst blutwurst rathskeller schweitzer cheese delicatessen hamburger i e steak kindergarten and katzenjammer footnote the majority of these words it will be noted relate to eating and drinking they mirror the profound effect of german immigration upon american drinking habits and the american cuisine it is a curious fact that loan words seldom represent the higher aspirations of the creditor nation french and german have borrowed from english not words of lofty significance but such terms as beefsteak roast beef pudding grog jockey tourist sport five o'clock tea cocktail and sweepstakes the contributions of england to european civilization as tested by the english words in continental languages says l p smith are not generally of a kind to cause much national self-congratulation nor would a german i dare say be very proud of the german contributions to american End footnote from them in all probability there also came two very familiar americanisms loafer and bum the former according to the standard dictionary is derived from the german laufen another authority says that it originated in a german mispronunciation of lover i e as loafer thornton shows that the word was already in common use in eighteen thirty five bum was originally bummer and apparently derives from the german bummler footnote thornton offers examples of this form ranging from eighteen fifty six to eighteen eighty five during the civil war the word acquired the special meaning of looter the southerners thus applied it to sherman's men here is a popular rhyme that survived until the early nineties isidore pisht pisht watch de stor pisht pisht while i catch de bummer vat stole de suit of clothes bummelzug is common german slang for slow train End footnote. both words have produced derivatives loaf noun to loaf corner loafer 
common loafer, to bum, bum adjective, and bummery, not to mention on the bum. Loafer has migrated in England, but bum is still unknown there in the American sense. In English, indeed, bum is used to designate an unmentionable part of the body, and is thus not employed in polite discourse. Another example of debased German is offered by the American Chris Kringle. It is from Christkindlein or Christkindl, and properly designates, of course, not the patron saint of Christmas, but the child in the manger. A German friend tells me that the form Chris Kringle, which is that given in the standard dictionary, and the form Chris Kingel, which is that most commonly used in the United States, are both quite unknown in Germany. Here, obviously, we have an example of a loan word in decay. Whole phrases have gone through the same process. For example, nix com eros, from nichts kommt heraus, and raus mit im, from heraus mit im. These phrases, like wie geht's and ganz gut, are familiar to practically all Americans, no matter how complete their ignorance of correct German. Most of them know, too, the meaning of Gesundheit, Kummel, Seidel, Wanderlust, Stein, Speck, Menachor, Schutzenfest, Sangefest, Turnverein, Hock, Yodel, Zweibach, and Zwei, as in Zwei beer. I have found Snitz, Schnitz, in town topics. Prosit is in all American dictionaries. Footnote. Nevertheless, when I once put it into a night letter, a Western Union office refused to accept it, the rules requiring all night letters to be in plain English. Meanwhile, the English have borrowed it from American, and it is actually in the Oxford Dictionary. End footnote. Bauer, as used in cards, is an Americanism derived from the German Bauer, meaning the jack. The exclamation, ouch, is classed as an Americanism by Thornton, and he gives an example dated 1837. The New English Dictionary refers it to the German, ouch, and Thornton says that it may have come across with the Dunkers or the Mennonites. Ouch is not heard in English, save in the sense of a clasp or buckle set with precious stones. Noosh. And even in that sense, it is archaic. Scheister is very probably German also. Thornton has traced it back to the fifties. Footnote. The word is not in the Oxford Dictionary, but Castle gives it and says that it is German and an Americanism. The Standard Dictionary does not give its etymology. Thornton's first example, dated 1856, shows a variant spelling, S-H-U-Y-S-T-E-R, thus indicating that it was then recent. All subsequent examples show the present spelling. It is to be noted that the suffix S-T-E-R is not uncommon in English, and that it usually carries a deprecatory significance, as in trickster, punster, gamester, etc. End footnote. Rum dum is grounded upon the meaning of dumb borrowed from the German. It is not listed in the English slang dictionaries. Footnote. The use of dumb for stupid is widespread in the United States. Dumbhead, obviously from the German Dummkopf, appears in a list of Kansas words collected by Judge J. C. Ruppenthal of Russell, Kansas. It is also noted in Nebraska and the Western Reserve, and is very common in Pennsylvania. Urgucker, Gucken, is also on the Kansas list of Judge Ruppenthal. End footnote. Bristed says that the American meaning of wagon, which indicates almost any four-wheeled, horse-drawn vehicle in this country, but only the very heaviest in England, was probably influenced by the German wagen. He also says that the American use of 
hold on for stop was suggested by the german halt an and white says that the substitution of standpoint for point of view long opposed by all purists was first made by an american professor who sought an anglicized form of the german standpunkt the same german influence may be behind the general facility with which american forms compound nouns in most other languages for example latin and french the process is rare and even english lags far behind american but in german it is almost unrestricted it is says l p smith a great step in advance toward that ideal language in which meaning is expressed not by terminations but by the simple method of word position the immigrants from the south of ireland during the period under review exerted an influence upon the language that was vastly greater than that of the germans both directly and indirectly but their contributions to the actual vocabulary were probably less they gave american indeed relatively few new words perhaps chilele colleen spalpeen smithereens and poteen exhaust the unmistakably gaelic list lollapalooza is also probably an irish loan word though it is not gaelic it apparently comes from alle fusi a mayo provincialism signifying a sturdy fellow alle fusi in its turn comes from the french alle fusil meaning forward the muskets a memory according to p w joyce of the french landing at Killala in 1798 such phrases as erin go bra and such expletives as begob and begori may perhaps be added they have got into american though they are surely not distinctive americanisms but of far more importance than these few contributions to the vocabulary were certain speech habits that the irish brought with them habits of pronunciation of syntax and even of grammar these habits were in part the fruit of efforts to translate the idioms of gaelic into english and in part borrowings from the english of the age of james i the latter preserved by irish conservatism in speech footnote our people says dr joyce are very conservative in retaining old customs and forms of speech many words accordingly that are discarded as old-fashioned or dead and gone in england are still flourishing alive and well in ireland they represent the classical english of shakespeare's time End footnote. came into contact in america with habits surviving with more or less change from the same time and so gave those american habits an unmistakable reinforcement the yankees so to speak had lived down such jacobian pronunciations as tay for tea and desave for deceive and these forms on irish lips struck them as uncouth and absurd but they still clung in their common speech to such forms as hist for hoist bile for boil chaw for chew jine for join footnote pope rhymed join with mine divine and line dryden rhymed toil with smile william kenrick in seventeen seventy three seems to have been the first english lexicographer to denounce this pronunciation tay survived in england until the second half of the eighteenth century then it fell into disrepute and certain purists among them lord chesterfield attempted to change the e a sound to e e in all words including even great End footnote. sass for sauce height for height and wrench for rinse and lep for leap 
and the employment of precisely the same forms by the thousands of irish immigrants who spread through the country undoubtedly gave them a certain support and so protected them in a measure from the assault of the purists and the same support was given to drowned for drowned once it for once catch for catch again for against and honorary for ordinary certain usages of gaelic carried over into the english of ireland fell upon fertile soil in america one was the employment of the definite article before nouns as in french and german an irishman does not say i am good at latin but i am good at the latin in the same way an american does not say i had measles but i had the measles there is again the use of the prefix a before various adjectives and gerunds as in a going and a riding this usage of course is native to english as a board and a foot demonstrate but it is much more common in the irish dialect on account of the influence of the parallel gaelic form as in a n ace a near and it is also much more common in american there is yet again a use of intensifying suffixes often set down as characteristically american which was probably borrowed from the irish examples are no siree and yes indeedy and the later kiddo and skidoo as joyce shows such suffixes in irish english tend to become whole phrases the irishman is almost incapable of saying plain yes or no he must always add some extra and gratuitous asseveration footnote amusing examples are to be found in don levy's irish catechism to the question is the sun god the answer is not simply yes but yes certainly he is and to the question will god reward the good and punish the wicked the answer is certainly there is no doubt he will End footnote. the american is in like case his speech bristles with intensives bet your life not on your life well i guess and no mistake and so on the irish extravagance of speech struck a responsive chord in the american heart the american borrowed not only occasional words but whole phrases and some of them have become thoroughly naturalized joyce indeed shows the irish origin of scores of locutions that are now often mistaken for native americanisms for example great shakes dead as an intensive thank you kindly to split one's sides i e laughing and the tune the old cow died of not to mention many familiar similes and proverbs certain irish pronunciations gaelic rather than archaic english got into american during the nineteenth century among them one recalls bahoy which entered our political slang in the middle forties and survived into our own time again there is the very characteristic american word ballyhoo signifying the harangue of a ballyhoo man or spieler that is barker before a cheap show or by metaphor any noisy speech it is from ballyhooley the name of a village in cork once notorious for its brawls finally there is shebang Cheldevere derives it from the french caban but it seems rather more likely that it is from the irish shebeen the propagation of irishisms in the united states was helped during many years by the enormous popularity of various dramas of irish peasant life particularly those of dion boucicault so recently as nineteen ten an investigation made by the dramatic mirror showed that some of his pieces notably kathleen maverneen the colleen bawn and the chagron 
were still among the favorites of popular audiences such plays at one time were presented by dozens of companies and a number of irish actors among them andrew mack chauncey alcott and Busico himself made fortunes appearing in them an influence also to be taken into account is that of irish songs once in great vogue but such influences like the larger matter of american borrowings from anglo-irish remain to be investigated so far as i have been able to discover there is not a single article in print upon the subject here as elsewhere our philologists have wholly neglected a very interesting field of inquiry from other languages the borrowings during the period of growth were naturally less down to the last decades of the nineteenth century the overwhelming majority of immigrants were either germans or irish the jews italians and slavs were yet to come but the first chinese appeared in eighteen forty eight and soon their speech began to contribute its inevitable loanwords these words of course were first adopted by the miners of the pacific coast and a great many of them have remained california localisms among them such verbs as to yen to desire strongly as a chinaman desires opium and to flop flop to lie down and such nouns as fun a measure of weight but a number of others have got into the common speech of the whole country example fantan kowtow chop suey ginseng joss yokami and tong contrary to the popular opinion dope and hop are not from the chinese neither in fact is an americanism though the former has one meaning that is specially american i e that of information or formula as in racing dope and to dope out most etymologists derive the word from the dutch dupe a sauce in english as in american it signifies a thick liquid and hence the viscous cooked opium hop is simply the common name of the humulus lupulus the belief that hops have a soporific effect is very ancient and hop pillows were brought to america by the first english colonists the derivation of poker which came into american from california in the days of the gold rush has puzzled etymologists it is commonly derived from primero the name of a somewhat similar game popular in england in the sixteenth century but the relation seems rather fanciful it may possibly come indirectly from the danish word poker signifying the devil pokerish in the sense of alarming was a common adjective in the united states before the civil war thornton gives an example dated eighteen twenty seven Shield de Vere says that poker in the sense of a hobgoblin was still in use in eighteen seventy one but he derives the name of the game from the french poche push pocket he seems to believe that the bank or pool in the early days was called the poke barrea and leyland rejecting all these guesses derive poker from the yiddish poker which comes in turn from the verb pochgen signifying to conceal winnings or losses this pochgen is obviously related to the german pocher boaster braggart there were a good many german jews in california in the early days and they were ardent gamblers if barrea and leyland are correct then poker enjoys the honor of being the first loan word taken into american from the yiddish End of chapter three part four recording by linda johnson chapter three part five of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the american language by h l mencken chapter three the period of growth part five pronunciation 
Noah Webster, as we saw in the last chapter, sneered at the broad A in 1789 as an Anglomaniac affectation. In the course of the next twenty-five years, however, he seems to have suffered a radical change of mind, for in The American Spelling Book, published in 1817, he ordained it in ask, last, mass, ant, grant, glass, and their analogues, and in his 1829 revision he clung to this pronunciation, beside adding master, pastor, amass, quaff, laugh, craft, etc., and even massive. There is some difficulty, however, in determining just what sound he proposed to give the A, for there are several A sounds that pass as broad, and the two main ones differ considerably. One appears in all, and may be called the A-W sound. The other is in art, and may be called the ah sound. A quarter of a century later, Richard Grant White distinguished between the two, and denounced the former as a British peculiarity. Frank H. Visitelli, writing in 1917, still noted the difference, particularly in such words as daunt, saunter, and laundry. It is probable that Webster, in most cases, intended to advocate the ah sound as in father, for this pronunciation now prevails in New England. Even there, however, the A often drops to a point midway between ah and a, ah, though never actually descending to the flat AA as in an, at, and anatomy. But the imprimatur of the Yankee Johnson was not potent enough to stay the course of nature, and, save in New England, the flat A swept the country. He himself allowed it in stamp and vaz. His successor and rival, Lyman Cobb, decided for it in pass, draft, stamp, and dance, though he kept to the ah sound in laugh, path, daunt, and saunter. By 1850, the flat A was dominant everywhere west of the Berkshires and south of New Haven, and had even got into such proper names as Lafayette and Nevada. Footnote. Richard Mead Bach denounced it in Lafayette during the 60s. Vide his Vulgarisms and Other Errors of Speech, 2nd edition, Philadelphia, 1869, page 65. End footnote. Webster failed in a number of his other attempts to influence American pronunciation. His advocacy of deaf for deaf had popular support while he lived, and he dredged up authority for it out of Chaucer and Sir William Temple. But the present pronunciation gradually prevailed, though deaf remains familiar in the common speech. Joseph E. Worcester and other rival lexicographers stood against many of his pronunciations, and he took the field against them in the prefaces to the successive editions of his spelling books. Thus, in that to the elementary spelling book, dated 1829, he denounced the affectation of inserting a Y sound before the U in such words as gradual and nature, with its compensatory change of D into a French J, and of T into CH. The English lexicographer John Walker had argued for this affectation in 1791, but Webster's prestige, while he lived, remained so high in some quarters that he carried the day, and the older professors at Yale, it is said, continued to use nature down to 1839. He favored the pronunciation of either and neither as either and neither, and so did most of the English authorities of his time. The original pronunciation of the first syllable in England probably made it rhyme with bay, but the ee -E sound was firmly established by the end of the 18th century. Toward the middle of the following century, however, 
there arose a fashion of an ai sound and this affectation was borrowed by certain americans gould in the fifties put the question why do you say either and neither to various americans the reply he got was the words are so pronounced by the best educated people in england this imitation still prevails in the cities of the east all of us says lounsbury are privileged in these latter days frequently to witness painful struggles put forth to give to the first syllable of these words the sound of i by those who have been brought up to give it the sound of e there is apparently an impression on the part of some that such a pronunciation establishes on a firm foundation an otherwise doubtful social standing but the vast majority of americans continue to say either and not either white and Bizzatelli, like lounsbury argue that they are quite correct in doing so the use of either says white is no more than a copy of a second-rate british affectation End of chapter 3, part 5. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 4, part 1 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today. Part One, The Two Vocabularies By way of preliminary to an examination of the American of today, I offer a brief list of terms in common use that differ in American and English. Here are two hundred of them, all chosen from the simplest colloquial vocabularies, and without any attempt at plan or completeness. American, Ashcan English, Dustbin American baby carriage english pram american backyard english garden american baggage english luggage american baggage car english luggage van american ballast railroad english metals American bathtub, English bath, American beet, English beetroot, American bid, noun, English tender, American billboard, English hoarding, American border, English paying guest, American boardwalk, seaside english promenade american bond finance english debenture american boot english blucher or wellington american brakeman english brakesman american bucket english pail American bumper, car, English buffer, American bureau, English chest of drawers, American calendar, court, English cause list, American campaign, political, English canvas, American can, noun, English tin american candy english sweets american cane english stick american canned goods english tinned goods american car railroad english carriage van or wagon american checkers game english Drafts American Chicken Yard English Fowl Run American Chief Clerk English Head Clock American City Editor 
English Chief Reporter American City Ordinance English Bylaw American Clipping Newspaper English Cutting American Coal Oil English Paraffin American Coal Scuttle English Coal Hod American Commission Merchant English Factor American Conductor of a Train English Guard American Corn English Maize or Indian Corn American Corner of a Street English Crossing American Corset English Stays American Counterfeiter English Coiner American Cowcatcher English Plow American Cracker English Biscuit American Cross Tie English Sleeper American Delicatessen Store English Italian Warehouse American Department Store English Stores American Derby Hat English Bowler American Dime Novel English Shilling Shocker American Druggist English Chemist American Drugstore English Chemist's Shop American Drummer English Bagman American Dry Goods Store English Draper's Shop American Editorial English Leader or Leading Article American Elevator English Lift American Elevator Boy English Lift Man American Excursionist English Tripper American Express Company English Carrier American Filing Cabinet English Nest of Drawers American Fire Department English Fire Brigade American Fish Dealer English Fishmonger American Floor Walker English Shop Walker American Fraternal Order English Friendly Society American Freight English Goods American Freight Agent English Goods Manager American Freight Car English Goods Wagon American Frog Railway English Crossing Plate American Garters Men's English Sock Suspenders American Gasoline English Petrol American Grade Railroad English Gradient American Grain English Corn American Grain Broker English Corn Factor American Grip English Hold All American Groceries English Stores American Hardware Dealer English Ironmonger American Haystack English Haycock American Headliner English Topliner American Hod Carrier English Hodman American Hogpin English Piggery American Hospital Private English Nursing Home American Huckster English Coster Monger American Hunting English Shooting American Indian English Red Indian American Indian Summer English St. Martin's Summer American Installment Business English Credit Trade American Installment Plan English Higher Purchase Plan American Janitor English Caretaker 
American Legal Holiday English Bank Holiday American Letter Box English Pillar Box American Letter Carrier English Postman American Livery Stable English Muse Footnote It should be noted that Muse is used only in the larger cities. In the small towns Livery Stable is commoner. Muse is quite unknown in America save as an occasional archaism. End footnote. American Locomotive Engineer English Engine Driver American Lumber English Deals American Mad English Angry American Methodist English Wesleyan American Molasses English Treacle American Monkey Wrench English Spanner American Moving Picture Theater English Cinema American Napkin Dinner English Serviette American Necktie English Tie or Cravat American News Dealer English News Agent American Newspaper Man English Pressman or Journalist American Oatmeal English Porridge American Office Holder English Public Servant American Orchestra Seats in a Theater English Stalls American Overcoat English Greatcoat American Package English Parcel American Parlor English Drawing Room American Parlor Car English Saloon Carriage American Patrolman Police English Constable American Payday English Wage Day American Peanut English Monkey Nut American Pie Fruit English Tart American Pitcher English Jug American Poorhouse English Workhouse American Post Paid English Post Free American Pot Pie English Pie American Prepaid English Carriage Paid American Press Printing English Machine American Program of a Meeting English Agenda American Proofreader English Corrector of the Press American Public School English Board School American Quotation Marks English Inverted Commas American Railroad English Railway American Railroad Man English Railway Servant American Rails English Line American Rare of Meat English Underdone American Receipts in Business English Takings American Rhine Wine English Hawk American Roadbed Railroad English Permanent Way American Road Repairer English Road Mender American Roast English Joint American Roll Call English Division American Rooster English Cock American Round Trip Ticket English Return Ticket American Rutabaga English Mangle Wurzel American Saleswoman English Shop Assistant American Saloon English Public House American Scarf Pin English Tie Pin American Scow English Lighter American Sewer English Drain American Shirtwaist 
English blouse. American shoe. English boot. American shoemaker. English bootmaker. American shoestring. English bootlace. American shoe tree. English boot form. American sick. English ill. American sidewalk. English pavement. American silver, collectively. English plate. American sled. English sledge. American sleigh. English sledge. American soft drinks. English minerals. American spigot. English tap. American squash. English vegetable marrow. American stem winder. English keyless watch. American stockholder. English shareholder. American stocks. English shares. American store fixtures. English shop fittings. American street cleaner. English crossing sweeper. American street railway. English tramway. American subway. English tube or underground. American suspenders, men's. English braces. American sweater. English jersey. American switch, noun, railway. English points. American switch, verb, railway. English shunt. American taxes, municipal. English rates. American taxpayer, local. English ratepayer. American tenderloin of beef. English undercut. American ten pins. English nine pins. American thumbtack. English drawing pin. American ticket office. English booking office. American tenor. English tinker. American tin roof. English leads. American track, railroad. English line. American trained nurse. English hospital nurse. American transom of door. English fanlight. American trolley car. English tram car. American truck vehicle. English lorry. American truck of a railroad car. English bogey. American trunk. English box. American typewriter operator. English typist. American typhoid fever. English enteric. American undershirt. English vest. American vaudeville theater. English music hall. American vegetables. English greens. American vest. English waistcoat. American warden of a prison. English governor. American warehouse. English stores. American wash rag. English face cloth. American washstand. English wash hand stand. American wash wringer. English mangle. American waste basket. English waste paper basket. American whipple tree. Footnote. Sometimes whiffle tree. End footnote. English splinter bar. American witness stand. English witness box. American wood alcohol. English methylated spirits. End of chapter 4 part 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 4, Part 2 of The American Language. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today, Part 2, Differences in Usage. The differences here listed, most of them between words in everyday employment, are but examples of a divergence in usage which extends to every department of daily life. In his business, in his journeys from his home to his office, in his dealings with his family and servants, and in his sports and amusements, in his politics, and even in his religion, the American uses not only words and phrases, but whole syntactical constructions that are unintelligible to the Englishman, or intelligible only after laborious consideration. A familiar anecdote offers an example in miniature. It concerns a young American woman living in a region of prolific orchards who is asked by a visiting Englishman what the residents do with so much fruit. Her reply is a pun, quote, We eat all we can and what we can't we can, end quote. This answer would mystify nine Englishmen out of ten, for in the first place it involves the use of the flat American A in can and in the second place it applies an unfamiliar name to the vessel that every Englishman knows as a tin, and then adds to the confusion by deriving a verb from the substantive. There are no such things as canned goods in England. Over there they are tinned. The can that holds them is a tin. To can them is to tin them, and they are counted not as groceries, but as stores and advertised not on billboards but on hoardings, and the cook who prepares them for the table is not Nora or Maggie, but cook, and if she does other work in addition, she is not a girl for general housework, but a cook general, and not help, but a servant, and the boarder who eats them is not a boarder at all, but a paying guest, though he is said to board and the grave of the tin, once it is emptied, is not the trash can, but the dust bin, and the man who carries it away is not the garbage man, or the ash man, or the white wings, but the dust man. An Englishman entering his home does not walk in upon the first floor, but upon the ground floor, which he calls the first floor, or more commonly first story not forgetting the penultimate E, is what we call the second floor, and so on up to the roof, which is covered not with tin, but with slate, tiles, or leads. He does not take a paper, he takes in a paper. He does not ask his servant, is there any mail for me, but are there any letters for me? For mail, in the American sense, is a word he seldom uses save in such compounds as mail van and mail train. He always speaks of it as the post. The man who brings it is not a letter carrier, but a postman. It is posted, not mailed, at a pillar box, not a mailbox. It never includes postal cards, but only postcards. Never money orders, but only postal orders. The Englishman dictates his answers not to a typewriter, but to a typist. A typewriter is merely the machine. If he desires the recipient to call him by telephone, he doesn't say phone me at quarter of eight, but ring me up at quarter to eight. And when the call comes in, he says, are you there? When he gets home, he doesn't find his wife waiting for him in the parlor or living room, but in the drawing room or in her sitting room. And the tale of domestic disaster that she has to tell does not concern the hired girl but the slavey and the scullery maid. He doesn't bring her a box of candy, but a box of sweets. He doesn't leave a derby hat in the hall, but a bowler. His wife doesn't wear shirt waists, but blouses. When she buys one, she doesn't say charge it, but put it down. When she orders a tailor-made suit, she calls it a coat and skirt. When she wants a spool of thread, 
she asks for a reel of cotton. Such things are bought not in the department stores, but at the stores, which are substantially the same thing. In these stores, calico means a plain cotton cloth. In the United States, it means a printed cotton cloth. Things bought on the installment plan in England are said to be bought on the higher purchase plan or system. The installment business itself is the credit trade, goods ordered by post, not mail, on which the dealer pays the cost of transportation, are said to be sent not post-paid or prepaid, but post-free or carriage-free paid. An Englishman does not wear suspenders and neckties, but braces and cravats. Suspenders are his wife's garters. His own are sock suspenders. The family does not seek sustenance in a rare tenderloin and squash, but in underdone undercut and vegetable marrow. It does not eat beets, but beet greens. The wine on the table, if miraculously German, is not Rhine wine, but hock. The maid who laces the stays of the mistress of the house is not Maggie, but Robinson. The nursemaid is not Lizzie, but nurse. And so, by the way, is a trained nurse in a hospital whose full style is not Miss Jones, but Nurse Jones. And the hospital itself, if private, is not a hospital at all, but a nursing home. And its trained nurses are plain nurses or hospital nurses, or maybe nursing sisters. And the white-clad young gentlemen who make love to them are not studying medicine, but walking the hospitals. Similarly, an English law student does not study law, but the law. If an English boy goes to a public school, it is not a sign that he is getting his education free, but that his father is paying a good round sum for it and is accepted as a gentleman. A public school over there corresponds to our prep school. It is a place maintained chiefly by endowments, wherein boys of the upper classes are prepared for the universities. What we know as a public school is called a board school in England, not because the pupils are boarded, but because it is managed by a school board. English schoolboys are divided not into classes or grades, but into forms, which are numbered, the lowest being the first form. The benches they sit on are also called forms. The principal of an English school is a headmaster or headmistress. The lower pedagogues used to be ushers, but they are now assistant masters or mistresses. The head of a university is a chancellor. He is always some eminent public man, and a vice-chancellor performs his duties. The head of a mere college may be a president, principal, rector, dean, or provost. At the universities, the students are not divided into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, as with us, but are simply first-year men, second-year men, and so on. Such distinctions, however, are not as important in England as in America. Members of the university, they are called members, not students, do not flock together according to seniority. An English university man does not study, he reads. He knows nothing of frats, class days, senior proms, and such things. Save at Cambridge and Dublin, he does not even have a commencement. On the other hand, his daily speech is full of terms unintelligible to an American student. For example, wrangler, tripos, head, past degree, and don. The upkeep of board schools in England comes out of the rates, which are the local taxes levied upon householders. For that reason, an English municipal taxpayer is called a rate payer. The functionaries who collect and spend his money are not office holders, but public servants. The head of the local police is not a chief of police, but a chief constable. The fire department is the fire brigade. The street cleaner is a crossing sweeper. The parish poorhouse is a workhouse. If it is maintained by two or more parishes jointly, it becomes a union. A pauper who accepts his hospitality is said to be on the rates. A policeman is a bobby, familiarly and constable officially. He is commonly mentioned in the newspapers, not by his surname, 
but as PC643A, that is Police Constable number 643A, the Fire Laddie, the Ward Executive, the Roundsman, the Strong Arm Squad, and other such objects of American devotion are unknown in England. An England saloon keeper is officially a licensed victualler. His saloon is a public house, or colloquially a pub. He does not sell beer by the bucket, or can, or growler, or schooner, but by the pint. He and his brethren taken together are the licensed trade. His back room is a parlor. If he has a few upholstered benches in his place, he usually calls it a lounge. He employs no bartenders or mixologists. Barmaids do the work, maybe with a barman to help. The American language, as we have seen, has begun to take in the English boot and shop, and is showing hospitality to headmaster, haberdasher, and weekend. But subaltern, civil servant, porridge, moor, draper, treacle, tram, and mufti are still strangers in the United States, as bleachers, picayune, airline, campus, chore, scoot, stogie, and hoodoo are in England. A subaltern is a commissioned officer in the army, under the rank of captain. A civil servant is a public servant in the national civil service. If he is of high rank, he is usually called a permanent official. Porridge, moor, scullery, draper, treacle, and tram, though unfamiliar, still need no explanation. Mufti means ordinary male clothing. An army officer out of uniform is said to be in mufti. To this officer, a sack suit or business suit is a lounge suit. He carries his clothes not in a trunk or grip or suitcase, but in a box. He does not miss a train. He loses it. He does not ask for a round-trip ticket, but for a return ticket. If he proposes to go to the theater, he does not reserve or engage seats. He books them, and not at the box office, but at the booking office. If he sits downstairs, it is not in the orchestra, but in the stalls. If he likes vaudeville, he goes to a music hall, where the headliners are the top liners. If he has to stand in line, he does it not in a line, but in a queue. In England, a corporation is a public company or limited liability company. The term corporation over there is applied to the mayor, aldermen, and sheriffs of a city, as in the London Corporation. An Englishman writes LTD, period, after the name of an incorporated bank or trading company as we write INC. He calls its president its chairman or managing director. Its stockholders are its shareholders and hold shares instead of stock in it. Its bonds are debentures. The place wherein such companies are floated and looted, the Wall Street of England, is called the City, with a capital C. Bankers, stock jobbers, promoters, directors, and other such leaders of its business are called the city men. The financial editor of a newspaper is its city editor. Government's bonds are consoles or stocks or the funds. To have money in the stocks is to own such bonds. Promissory notes are bills. An Englishman hasn't a bank account but a banking account. He draws checks, C-H-E-Q-U-E-S, not checks not on his bank, but on his bankers. In England, there's a rigid distinction between a broker and a stockbroker. A broker means not a dealer in securities, as in our Wall Street broker, but a dealer in secondhand furniture. To have the brokers in the house means to be bankrupt, with one's very household goods in the hands of of one's creditors. Tariff reform in England does not mean a movement toward free trade, but one toward protection. The word government, meaning what we call the administration, is always capitalized and plural. That is, the government are considering the advisability, etc. Vestry, committee, council, 
ministry, and even company are also plural, though sometimes not capitalized. A member of parliament does not run for office, he stands. He does not make a campaign, but a canvas. He does not represent a district, but a division or constituency. He never makes a stumping trip, but always a speaking tour. When he looks after his fences, he calls it nursing the constituency. At a political meeting, they are often rough in England. The bouncers are called stewards. Suffragettes used to delight in stabbing them with hairpins. A member of parliament is not afflicted by the numerous bugaboos that menace an American congressman. He knows nothing of lame ducks, pork barrels, gag rules, junkets, gerrymanders, omnibus bills, snakes, niggers in the woodpile, salt river, crow, bosses, ward healers, men higher up, silk stockings, repeaters, ballot box stuffers, and straight and split tickets. He always calls them ballots or voting papers. He has never heard of direct primaries, recall, or the initiative and referendum. A roll call in Parliament is a division. A member speaking is said to be up on his legs. When the House adjourns, it is said to rise. A member referring to another in the course of debate does not say the gentleman from Manchester, but the honorable gentleman, written H-O-N period gentleman. Or if he happens to be a privy councillor, the right honorable gentleman. Or if he is a member for one of the universities, the honorable and learned gentleman. If the speaker chooses to be intimate or facetious, he may say my honorable friend. In the United States, a pressman is a man who runs a printing press. In England, he is a newspaper reporter, or as the English usually say, a journalist. This journalist works not at space rates, but at lineage rates. A printing press is a machine. An editorial in a newspaper is a leading article or leader. An editorial photograph is a leaderette. A newspaper clipping is a cutting. A proofreader is a corrector of the press. A pass to the theater is an order. The room clerk of a hotel is the secretary. A real estate agent or dealer is an estate agent. The English keep up most of the odd distinctions between physicians and surgeons, barristers, and solicitors. A surgeon is often plain mister and not doctor. Neither he nor a doctor has an office, but always a surgery or consulting room. A barrister is greatly superior to a solicitor. He alone can address the higher courts and the parliamentary committees. A solicitor must keep to office work and the courts of the first instance. A man with a grievance goes first to his solicitor, who then instructs or briefs a barrister for him. If that barrister in the course of the trial wants certain evidence removed from the record, he moves that it be struck out, not stricken out, as an American lawyer would say. Only barristers may become judges. An English barrister, like his American brother, takes a retainer when he's engaged, but the rest of his fee does not wait upon the termination of the case. He expects and receives a refresher from time to time. A barrister is never admitted to the bar, but is always called. If he becomes a king's counsel, or K.C., a purely honorary appointment, he is said to have taken silk. The common objects and phenomena of nature are often differently named in English and American. As we saw in a previous chapter, such Americanisms as creek and run for small streams are practically unknown in England, and the English moor and downs early disappeared from American. The Englishman knows the meaning of sound, that is, Long Island sound, but he nearly always uses channel in place of it. In the same way, the American knows the meaning of the English bog, but rejects the English distinction between it and swamp, and almost never uses swamp or marsh, often elided to mosh. The Englishman seldom, if ever, describes a severe storm as a hurricane, a cyclone, a tornado, or a blizzard. He never uses cold snap, 
cloudburst, or under the weather. He does not say that the temperature is 29 degrees Fahrenheit or that the thermometer or the mercury is at 29 degrees, but there are three degrees of frost. He calls ice water iced water. He knows nothing of bluegrass country or of penny y'all. What we call the mining regions he knows as the black country. He never, of course, uses down east or upstate. Many of our names for common fauna and flora are unknown to him, save as strange Americanisms, that is, terrapin, moose, persimmon, gumbo, eggplant, alfalfa, sweet corn, sweet potato, and yam. Until lately, he called the grapefruit a shaddock. He still calls the beet a beetroot and the rutabaga a mangle wurzel. He is familiar with many fish that we seldom see, that is, the turbo. He also knows the hare, which is seldom heard of in American, but he knows nothing of deviled crabs, crab cocktails, clam chowder, or oyster stew, and he never goes to oyster suppers, clam bakes, or bur burgaloo picnics. He doesn't buy peanuts when he goes to the circus. He calls them monkey nuts, and to eat them publicly is infra dig. The common American use of peanut as an adjective of disparagement as in peanut politics, is incomprehensible to him. In England, a hack is not a public coach, but a horse let out at hire, or one of similar quality. A life insurance policy is usually not an insurance policy at all, but an assurance policy. What we call the normal income tax is the ordinary tax, and what we call the surtax is the super tax. An Englishman never lives on a street, but always in it. He never lives in a block of houses, but in a row. It is never in a section of the city, but always in a district. Going home by train, he always takes the down train, no matter whether he is proceeding southward to Wimbledon, westward to Shepherd's Bush, northward to Tottenham, or eastward to Noakes Hill. A train headed toward London is always an up train, and the track it runs on is the up line. Eastbound and westbound tracks and trains are unknown in England. When an Englishman boards a bus, it is not at a street corner, but at a crossing, though he is familiar with such forms as Hyde Park Corner. The place he is bound for is not three squares or blocks away, but three turnings. Square in England always means a small park. A backyard is a garden. A subway is always a tube or the underground, as in the metro. But an underground passage for pedestrians is a subway. English streets have no sidewalks. They always call them pavements or footways. An automobile is always a motor car or motor. Auto is almost unknown, and with it the verb to auto. So is machine. So is joyride. An Englishman always calls russet yellow or tan shoes, brown shoes, or if they cover the ankle, boots. He calls a pocketbook a purse and gives the name of pocketbook to what we call a memorandum book. His walking stick is always a stick, never a cane. By cord, he means something strong, almost what we call twine. A thin cord he always calls a string. His twine is the lightest sort of string. When he applies the adjective homely to a woman, he means that she is simple and home-loving, not necessarily that she is plain. He uses dessert not to indicate the whole last course at dinner, but to designate the fruit only. The rest is ices or sweets. He uses vest, not in place of waistcoat, but in place of undershirt. Similarly, he applies pants, not to his trousers, but to his drawers. An Englishman who inhabits bachelor quarters is said to live in chambers. If he has a flat, he calls it a flat, not an apartment. Flat houses are often mansions. The janitor or superintendent thereof is a caretaker. The scoundrels who snoop around in search of divorce evidence are not private detectives, but private inquiry agents. The Englishman is naturally unfamiliar with baseball and in consequence his language is bare of the countless phrases and metaphors that it has applied to American. 
Many of these phrases and metaphors are in daily use among us. For example, fan, rooter, bleachers, batting average, doubleheader, pennant winner, gate money, busher, minor leaguer, glass arm, to strike out, to foul, to be shut out, to coach, to play ball, on the bench, on to his curves, and three strikes and out. The national game of draw poker has also greatly enriched American with terms that are either quite unknown to the Englishman or known to him only as somewhat dubious Americanisms. Among them, cold deck, kitty, full house, divvy, a card up his sleeve, three of a kind, to ante up, to pony up, to hold out, to cash in, to go it one better, to chip in, and for keeps. But the Englishman uses many more racing terms and metaphors than we do, and he has got a good many phrases from other games, particularly cricket. The word cricket itself has a definite figurative meaning. It indicates in general good sportsmanship. To take unfair advantage of an opponent is not cricket. The sport of boating, so popular on the Thames, has also given colloquial English some familiar terms, almost unknown in the United States. That is punt and weir. Contrarywise, pungy, bateau, and scow are unheard of in England, and canoe is not long emerged from the estate of an Americanism. The game known as ten pins in America is called nine pins in England, and once had that name over here. The Puritans forbade it, and its devotees changed its name in order to evade the prohibition. Finally, there is soccer, a form of football quite unknown in the United States. What we call simply football is rugby or rugger to the Englishman. The word soccer is derived from association. The rules of the game were established by the London Football Association. Soccer is one of the relatively few English experiments in ellipsis. Another is to be found in Baker Lou, the name of one of the London underground lines from Baker Street and Waterloo, its termini. The English have an ecclesiastical vocabulary with which we are almost unacquainted, and it is in daily use. The church bulks large in public affairs over there. Such terms as vicar, canon, verger, prebendary, primate, curate, nonconformist, dissenter, convocation, minister, chapter, crypt, living, presentation, glebe, benefice, locum tenens, suffragan, almoner, dean, and pluralist are to be met in the English newspapers constantly, but on this side of the water they are seldom encountered. Nor do we hear much of matins, louds, lay readers, ritualism, and the liturgy. The English use of holy orders is also strange to us. They do not say that a young man is studying for the ministry, but that he is reading for holy orders. They do not say that he is ordained, but that he takes orders. Save he be in the United Free Church of Scotland, he is never a minister. Save he be nonconformist, he is never a pastor. A clergyman of the establishment is always either a rector, a vicar, or a curate, and colloquially a parson. In American, chapel simply means a small church, usually the branch of some larger one. In English, it has a special sense of place of worship, unconnected with the establishment. Though three-fourths of the people of Ireland are Catholics, in Munster and Connaught, more than nine-tenths, and the Protestant Church of Ireland has been disestablished since 1871, a Catholic place of worship in the country is still a chapel, not a church. So is a Methodist whaling place in England, however large it may be, though now and then a tabernacle is substituted. In the same way, the English Catholics sometimes vary chapel with oratory, as in Brompton Oratory. A Methodist in Great Britain is not a Methodist, but a Wesleyan. Contrarywise, what the English call simply a churchman is an Episcopalian in the United States. What they call the church, always capitalized, 
is the Protestant Episcopal Church. What they call a Roman Catholic is simply a Catholic, and what they call a Jew is usually softened, if he happens to be an advertiser, to a Hebrew. The English Jews have no such idiotic fear of the plain name as that which afflicts the more pushing and obnoxious of the race in America. News of Jewry is a common headline in the London Daily Telegraph, which is owned by Lord Burnham, a Jew, and has had many Jews on its staff, including Judah P. Benjamin, the American. The American language, of course, knows nothing of dissenters, nor of such gladiators of dissent as the Plymouth Brethren, nor of the nonconformist conscience, though the United States suffers from it even more damnably than England. The English, to make it even, get on without circuit riders, holy rollers, drunkards, Seventh-day Adventists, and other such American ferret nature, and are born, live, die, and go to heaven without the aid of either the uplift or the Chautauqua. In music, the English cling to an archaic and unintelligible nomenclature long since abandoned in America. Thus they call a double whole note a brave, a whole note a semi-brave, and a half note a minim, a quarter note a crotchet, an eighth note a quaver, a sixteenth note a semi-quaver, a thirty-second note a demi-semi-quaver, and a sixty-fourth note hemi-demi-semi-quaver, or semi-demi-sem-quaver. If by any chance an English musician should write a 128th note, he probably wouldn't know what to call it. This clumsy terminology goes back to the days of plain chant, with its longa, brevis, semi-brevis, minima, and semi-minima. The French and Italians cling to a system almost as confusing, but the Germans use ganz, halbe, vertel, achtel, etc. I have been unable to discover the beginnings of the American system, but it would seem to be borrowed from the German, since the earliest times the majority of music teachers in the United States have been Germans, and most of the rest have had German training. In the same way, the English hold fast to a clumsy and inaccurate method of designating the sizes of printers' types. In America, the simple point system makes the business easy. A line of 14-point type occupies exactly the vertical space of two lines of 7-point, but the British still indicate differences in size by such arbitrary and confusing names as brilliant, diamond, small pearl, pearl, ruby, ruby nonpareil, nonpareil, minion nonpareil, emerald, minion, brevier, bourgeois, long primer, small pica, pica, English, the great primer, and double pica. They also cling to a fossil system of numerals in stating ages. Thus an Englishman will say that he is seven and forty, not that he is forty-seven. This is probably a direct survival preserved by more than a thousand years of English conservatism of the Anglo-Saxon Seofan and Theotwig. He will also say that he weighs 11 stone instead of 154 pounds. A stone is 14 pounds, and it is always used in stating the heft of a man. Finally, he employs some designations of time as fortnight and twelve month, a great deal more than we do and has certain special terms of which we know nothing. For example, quarter day, bank holiday, long vacation, lady day, and Michaelmas. Per contra, he knows nothing whatever of our Thanksgiving, arbor, labor, and decoration days, or of legal holidays, or of Yom Kippur. In English usage, to proceed the word directly, is always used to signify immediately. In American, a contingency gets into it, and it may mean no more than soon. In England, quite means completely, wholly, entirely, altogether, to the utmost extent, nothing short of, in the fullest sense, positively, absolutely. In America, it is conditional, and means only nearly, approximately, substantially, 
as in he sings quite well. An Englishman does not say, I will pay you up for an injury, but I will pay you back. He doesn't look up a definition in the dictionary. He looks it out. He doesn't say, being ill, I am getting on well, but I am going on well. He doesn't use the American different from or different than. He uses different to. He never adds the pronoun in such locutions as it hurts me, but says simply it hurts. He never catches up with you on the street. He catches you up. He never says, are you through, but have you finished? He never uses to notify as a transitive verb. An official act may be notified, but not a person. He never uses gotten as the perfect participle of to get. He always uses plain got. An English servant never washes the dishes. She always washes the dinner or tea things. She doesn't live out, but goes into service. She smashes not the mirror, but the looking glass. Her beau is not her fellow, but her young man. She does not keep company with him, but walks out with him. That an Englishman always calls out, I say, and not simply say, when he desires to attract a friend's attention or register a protestation of incredulity, this perhaps is too familiar to need notice. His here, here, and oh, oh, are also well known. He is much less prodigal with goodbye than the American. He uses good day and good afternoon far more often. A shop assistant would never say goodbye to a customer. To an Englishman, it would have a subtly offensive smack. Good afternoon would be more respectful. Another word that makes him flinch is dirt. He never uses it as we do to describe the soil in the garden. He always says earth. Various very common American phrases are quite unknown to him. For example, over his signature, on time, and planted to corn. The first named he never uses, and he has no equivalent for it. An Englishman who issues a signed statement simply makes it in writing. He knows nothing of our common terms of disparagement, such as kike, wop, yap, and rube. His pet name for a tiller of the soil is not rube or sigh, but hodge. When he goes gunning, he does not call it hunting, but shooting. Hunting is reserved for the chase of the fox. An intelligent Englishwoman coming to America to live told me that the two things which most impeded her first communications with untraveled Americans, even above the gross differences between England and American pronunciation and intonation, were the complete absence of the general utility adjective jolly from the American vocabulary, and the puzzling omnipresence and versatility of the American verb to fix. In English colloquial usage, jolly means almost anything, it intensifies all other adjectives, even including miserable and homesick. An Englishman is jolly tired, jolly hungry, or jolly well tired. His wife is jolly sensible. His dog is jolly keen. The prices he pays for things are jolly dear, never stiff or high, all Americanism. But he has no noun to match the American proposition meaning proposal, business affair, case, consideration, plan, theory, solution, and what not. Only the German Zug can be ranged beside it, and he has no verb in such wide practice as to fix. In his speech, it means only to make fast or to determine. In American, it may mean to repair, as in the plumber fixed the pipe, to dress, as in Mary fixed her hair, to prepare, as in the cook is fixing the gravy, to bribe, as in the judge was fixed, to settle, as in the quarrel was fixed up, to heal, as in the doctor fixed his boil, to finish, as in Murphy fixed Sweeney in the third round, to be well-to-do, as in John is well fixed, to arrange, as in I fixed up the quarrel, to be drunk, as in the whiskey fixed him, to punish, as in I'll fix him, and to correct, as in he fixed my bad Latin. Moreover, it is used in all its English senses. An Englishman never goes to a dentist to have his teeth fixed. He does not fix the fire. He makes it up or mends it. 
he is never well fixed, either in money or by liquor. The English use quite a great deal more than we do, and as we have seen in a different sense. Quite rich in American means tolerably rich, richer than most. Quite so in English is identical in meaning with exactly so. In American, just is almost equivalent to the English quite, as in just lovely. Thornton shows that this use of just goes back to 1794. The word is also used in place of exactly in other ways as just in time, just how many, and just what do you mean. End of chapter 4, part 2. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4, Part 3 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today. Part 3. Honorifics. Among the honorifics and euphemisms in everyday use, one finds many notable divergences between the two languages. On one hand, the English are almost as diligent as the Germans in bestowing titles of honor upon their men of mark, and on the other hand, they are very careful to withhold such titles from men who do not legally bear them. In America, every practitioner of any branch of healing art, even a chiropodist or an osteopath, is a doctor, ipso facto. But in England, as we have seen, many good surgeons lack the title, and it is not common in the lesser ranks. Even graduate physicians may not have it, but here there is a yielding of the usual meticulous exactness, and it is customary to address a physician in the second person as doctor, although his card may show that he is only medicine baccalaureus, a degree quite unknown in America. Thus, an Englishman, when he is ill, always sends for the doctor, as we do. But a surgeon is usually plain mister, an English veterinarian, or dentist, or druggist, or masseur, is never doctor, nor professor. In all, save a few large cities of America, every male pedagogue is a professor, and so is every band leader, dancing master, and medical consultant. But in England the title is very rigidly restricted to men who hold chairs in the universities, a necessarily small body. Even here, a superior title always takes precedence. Thus it used to be Professor Almuth Wright, but now it is always Sir Almuth Wright. Huxley was always called Professor Huxley until he was appointed to the Privy Council. This appointment gave him the right to have Right Honorable put before his name and thereafter it was customary to call him simply Mr. Huxley, with the right honorable, so to speak, floating in the air. The combination to an Englishman was more flattering than professor, for the English always esteem political dignities far more than the dignities of learning. This explains, perhaps, why their universities distribute so few honorary degrees. In the United States, every respectable Protestant clergyman is a D.D., and it is almost impossible for a man to get into the papers without becoming an LLD. But in England, such honors are granted only grudgingly. So with military titles. To promote a war veteran from sergeant to colonel by acclamation, as is often done in the United States, is unknown over there. The English have nothing equivalent to the gaudy tin soldiers of our governor's staffs, nor to the bespangled colonels and generals of the Knights Templar, and patriarchs militant, nor to the nondescript captains and majors of our country towns. An English railroad conductor, railway guard, is never captain as he always is in the United States, nor are military titles used by the police, nor is it the custom to make every newspaper editor a colonel, as is done south of the Potomac, nor is an attorney general or postmaster general called general, nor are the glories of public office after they have officially come to an end, embalmed in such clumsy quasi-titles as ex-United States Senator, ex-Judge of the Circuit Court of Appeals, ex-Federal Trade Commissioner, 
and former chief of the fire department. But perhaps the greatest difference between English and American usage is presented by the honorable. In the United States, the title is applied loosely to all public officials of apparent respectability, from senators and ambassadors to the mayors of fifth-rate cities and the members of state legislatures, and with some show of official sanction to many of them, especially congressmen. But it is questionable whether this application has any actual legal standing, save perhaps in the case of certain judges. Even the President of the United States, by law, is not the Honorable, but simply the President. In the first Congress, the matter of his title was exhaustively debated. Some members wanted to call him the Honorable, and others proposed His Excellency and even His Highness. But the two houses finally decided it was not proper to annex any style or title other than that expressed by the Constitution. Congressmen themselves are not honorables. True enough, the Congressional record in printing a set speech calls it speech of Honorable John Jones without the the before the honorable, a characteristic Americanism. But in reporting the ordinary remarks of a member, it always calls him plain Mr. Nevertheless, a country congressman would be offended if his partisans in announcing his appearance on the stump did not prefix honorable to his name. So would a state senator. So would a mayor or governor. I have seen the sergeant-at-arms of the United States Senate referred to as honorable in the records of that body. Moreover, the prefix is actually usurped by the superintendent of state prisons of New York. In England, the thing is more carefully ordered, and all bogus honorables are unknown. The prefix is applied to both sexes and belongs by law inter alia to all present or past maids of honor, to all justices of the high court during their terms of office, to the Scotch lords of session, to the sons and daughters of viscounts and barons, to the younger sons and daughters of all earls, and to the members of the legislative and executive councils of the colony, but not to members of parliament, though each is, in debate, an honorable gentleman. Even a member of the cabinet is not an honorable, though he is a right honorable by virtue of membership in the Privy Council, of which the cabinet is legally merely a committee. The last honorific belongs not only to Privy Councillors, but also to all peers lower than Marquesas. Those above are most honorable. To Lord Mayors during their terms of office, to the Lord Advocate, and to the Lord Provosts of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Moreover, a peeress, whose husband is a right honorable, is a right honorable herself. The British colonies follow the jealous usage of the mother country. Even in Canada, the lawless American example is not imitated. I have before me a, quote, table of titles to be used in Canada, close quote, laid down by royal warrant, which lists those who are honorables and those who are not honorables in the utmost detail. Only privy councillors of Canada, not to be confused with imperial privy councillors, are permitted to retain the prefix after going out of office. Though ancients who were legislative councillors at the time of the Union, July 1, 1867, may still use it by sort of a courtesy, and former speakers of the Dominion Senate and House of Commons and various retired judges may do so on application to the king, countersigned by the governor-general. The following are lawfully the honorable, but only during their tenure of office. The solicitor-general, the speaker of the House of Commons, the presidents and speakers of the provincial legislatures, members of the executive councils of the provinces, the chief justice, the judges of the supreme and exchequer courts, the judges of the Supreme Courts of Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, the judges of the Courts of Appeal of Manitoba and British Columbia, and the Chancery Court of Prince Edward Island, and the Circuit Court of Montreal, these and no more. A lieutenant governor of a province is not the honorable, but his honor. The governor-general is his excellency, and so is his wife, but in practice they usually have superior honorifics and do not forget to demand their use. 
but though an Englishman and following him a colonial is thus very careful to restrict the honorable to proper uses. He always insists, when he serves without pay as an officer of any organization, to indicate his volunteer character by writing honorable before the name of his office. If he leaves it off, it is a sign that he is a hireling. Thus the agent of the New Zealand government in London, a paid officer, is simply the agent. But the agents at Brisbane and Adelaide in Australia, who serve for the glory of it, are honorable agents. In writing to a Briton, one must be careful to put Esquire behind his name and not Mr. before it. The English make a clear distinction between the two forms. Mr. on an envelope indicates that the sender holds the receiver to be his inferior. One writes to Mr. John Jackson, one's greengrocer, but to James Thompson, Esquire, one's neighbor. Any man who is entitled to the Esquire is a gentleman, by which an Englishman means a man of sound connections and dignified occupation, in brief, of ponderable social position. Thus, a dentist, a shopkeeper, or a clerk can never be a gentleman in England, even by courtesy, and the qualifications of an author, a musical conductor, a physician, or even a member of Parliament have to be established. But though he is thus enormously watchful of his masculine dignity, an Englishman is quite careless in the use of lady. He speaks glibly of lady clerks, lady typists, lady doctors, and lady inspectors. In America, there is a strong disposition to use the word less and less, as is revealed by the substitution of saleswoman and salesgirl for the saleslady of yesterday. But in England, lady is still invariably used instead of woman in such compounds as lady golfer, lady secretary, and lady champion. The women's singles in English tennis are always ladies' singles. Women's wear in English shops is always ladies' wear. Perhaps the cause of this distinction between lady and gentleman has been explained by Price Collier in, quote, England and the English, close quote. In England, according to Collier, the male is always first. His comfort goes before his wife's comfort and maybe his dignity also. Gentleman clerk or gentleman author would make an Englishman howl, though he uses gentleman writer. So would the growing American custom of designating successive heirs of a private family by the numerals proper to royalty. John Smith III and William Simpson IV are gravely received at Harvard. At Oxford, they would be ragged unmercifully. An Englishman in speaking or writing of public officials avoids those long and clumsy combination of title and name, which figure so copiously in American newspapers. Such locutions as Assistant Secretary of the Interior Jones, Fourth Assistant Postmaster General Brown, Inspector of Boilers Smith, Judge of the Appeal Tax Court Robinson, Chief Clerk of the Treasury Williams, and Collaborating Epidermiologist White are quite unknown to him. When he mentions a high official, such as the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, he does not think it necessary to add the man's name. He says simply, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, or the Foreign Secretary. And so with the Lord Chancellor, the Chief Justice, the Prime Minister, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Chief Rabbi, the First Lord of the Admiralty, the Master of Pembroke College, the Italian Ambassador, and so on. Certain ecclesiastical titles are sometimes coupled to surnames in the American manner, such as Dean Stanley and Canon Wilberforce. But Prime Minister Lord George would seem heavy and absurd. But in other directions, the Englishman has a certain clumsiness of his own. Thus, in writing a letter to a relative stranger, he sometimes begins it not, My dear Mr. Jones, but My dear John Joseph Jones. He may even use such a form as my dear secretary for war in place of the American my dear Mr. Secretary. In English usage, incidentally, my dear is more formal than simply dear. In America, of course, this distinction is lost, and such forms as my dear John Joseph Jones 
appear only as conscious imitations of English usage. I have spoken of the American custom of dropping the definite article before honorable. It extends to reverend and the like, and has the authority of very respectable usage behind it. The opening sentence of the congressional record is always the chaplain, reverend, blank, D.D., offered the following prayer. When chaplains for the Army or Navy are confirmed by the Senate, they always appear in the record as reverends, never as the reverend. I also find the honorific without the article in the New International Encyclopedia and in a widely popular American grammar book. So long ago as 1867, Gould protested against this elison as barbarous and idiotic and drew up the following reductu ad absurdum. At the last annual meeting of the Black Book Society, Honorable John Smith took the chair, assisted by Reverend John Brown and Venerable John White. The office of secretary would have been filled by late John Green, but for his decease which rendered him ineligible. His place was supplied by inevitable John Black. In the course of the evening eulogies, were pronounced on distinguished John Gray and notorious Joseph Brown. Marked compliment was also paid to able historian Joseph White, discriminating philosopher Joseph Green, and learned professor Joseph Black. But conspicuous speech of the evening was witty Joseph Gray's apostrophe to eminent astronomer Jacob Brown, subtle logician Jacob White, etc., etc., Richard Grant White, a year or two later, joined the attack in the New York Galaxy, and William Cullen Bryant included the omission of the article in his Index Expurgatorius. But these anathemas were ineffective as Gould's irony. The more careful American journals, of course, inclined to the the, and I note that it is specifically ordained on the style sheet of Century Magazine but the overwhelming majority of American newspapers get along without it, and I have often noticed its omission on the sign boards at church entrances. In England, it is never omitted. End of chapter 4, part 3. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona.